Okay, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Juliana and I'll be presenting my Keystone project and constructed languages. Professor Neil Myler and special thanks to Professor Jonathan Barr for me with the data analysis. So what is a constructed language? A language is there closely known is a language that is artificially created by one or more people in a relatively period of time. So some examples in Klingon, which was created for the Star Trek universe, Esperanto, which was created to facilitate cross-linguistic communication, and log language was created to test a linguistic hypothesis. Now, Collins um, directly oppose natural languages or natlangs, which are languages that develop obviously in communities of practice over long periods of time and don't have a clear origin or creation. So some examples include ASL and Maori. Um, so what would be this? Uh, studying conlangs was actually my first idea when I toured Kilishan for the first time. I said, that's what I'm going to do. And here I am doing it. Um, the idea that humans can replicate natural processes such as creation to a good degree of accuracy is fascinating to me. But how accurate are people really at creating like that mimic natural changes. And that is the focus of the first project, which was a research study. Um, the central question being uh, whether people can tell the difference between natlings and conlings just by hearing a clip. So my hypothesis was that people who have more linguistic knowledge will perform better at task. I took the form of a metric survey with 14 30 second clips, seven natural languages and seven constructed languages. And participants just had to listen to the clips and select what they thought what they were listening to was were asked about their linguistic ability, so whether they were monolingual or multilingual, and whether they had formal linguistic training. Now, at first glance, the results of the study seem to support this hypothesis. This is a graph of average scores correct um, for the different groups. So uh, the one group that seems a little bit out there is the monolingual linguist group uh, in the second column here, uh, who had an average score of 9.2 out of 14. This average score is only so high because there were only five participants in this group. But uh, seems to support it, right? So there's uh, the monolingual non-lingual lowest average score 8.56 out of 14, and the lingual linguists had a um, the highest average 8.86 out of 14. However, after performing a two-way ANOVA with the help of Professor Barnes, I found that neither multilingualism nor linguistic training uh, was a st significant statistical factor in uh, people's performance in this task. And you can see the p-values here if you're a math person. Um, the overall numbers, however, um, point to something a little different. So you can see um, from this graph of the average scores that a majority of people perform better than that is a seven of 14. And testing this null hypothesis with a one-way two test, that is a, testing the hypothesis of people getting seven correct out of 14, uh, found that uh, it rejected the null hypothesis, which means that there is something to the idea that people can difference can see that something seems unnatural about certain constructed languages. Um, and I think that this should be a of further study because it's really interesting questions. Um, my study had limitations, of course. I only had 88 participants, and a majority of those were members of the BU community my own age. So I think if I were to do this um, again, I would like to have a lot more participants, and I would also like to have a broader range of is socioeconomic statuses um, and education levels um, just to have a broader range of participants. So the second part of my project was uh, the be beginning to create my own language called Azakeye. So I didn't, I wanted to make my language as natural sounding as possible, but I didn't want to base it on any specific language or family because I didn't want to fall into um, a hole of like making it too much like any one language. Um, so up in my was the creating a study of speakers because you can't really have a language without people who speak. Um, so I ended up deciding on island society with a focus on sea exploration. Uh, so the reason behind choosing an island was islands are actually perfect linguistic bubbles because languages can develop and um, grow without interference from other languages. And for my purposes, this was good that I didn't have to create a whole bunch of other constructed languages that would have had an effect on my language. Um, the focus on sea exploration, because I grew up by the ocean, I've always had uh, been fascinated by stories of pirates and Vikings and wayfinders and things like that. So that'd be a fun thing to include uh, in this society. Uh, my society is also matrilineal, polytheist, and relatively egalitarian. One way that I did research for this part of my project was using the World Atlas of Language Structures, which is a database of a bunch of different linguistic features with maps showing languages across the world. Have those features. Um, so this is a of word orders, cross-linguistic 
So the most prevalent word or, um, across the world is a uh, subject object verb, which is represented blue circle here. I actually ended up going with a verb object word order, uh, which is by the yellow circles on this map, which is a much less prevalent word order, but I kind of wanted to challenge myself uh, using a, a word structure that I was uh, slightly less familiar with. So uh, the next step in my process was to create a sound system. And so all the sounds here are represented with the International Phonetic Alphabet, an alphabet that linguists use to, uh, to represent any language. Uh, so what I did was I figured out what the most common sounds were across linguistically, which are represented here in red. Um, I built the rest of my sound system around that. Um, the first three words that I came up with in my language were the names of the three goddesses. So Asha is the goddess of the ocean and of death. Ama is the goddess of the sky. And Aka is the goddess of the land. I wanted to start with creating the gods um, because religion is, of course, a central part of society. And I wanted to be able to create words and phrases um, that had to do with gods and religion. Um, the word deity is Ana'e. The word for woman and person is Aza'e. Um, and I wanted to make the word for woman and person the same because I had found several languages in which they made the words for man and person the same. I kind of wanted to flip the script on that in my language, especially because this is a matrilineal society. The word for man is azame. The word for child is azage. The word for baby is ge. The way you conjugate verbs in the present tense in this language is you take a root and a both a prefix and a suffix. The suffix in the present tense is always e, and the uh, prefix is uh, a copy of the first consonant in root and a vowel. The vowel uh, is e if the subject is singular and u if the subject is plural. One thing that you might uh, notice here is that there is only one third person singular pronoun, so there isn't a difference between he or she, there is just de. Is, however, a difference between the first person plural inclusive and first person plural exclusive. This basically means that if I were talking to somebody and I wanted to refer to self and them and possibly other people, I would use the, uh, the pronoun. Uh, and if I were to somebody and wanted to refer to myself and other people, but not the person that I was talking to, I would use you, me. Um, so I'll just pronounce a couple of these for you. So first person singular to be would be Kiko. Uh, third person singular to be would be Koshi Eki. Uh, second person singular to would be ishoshiban, uh, and first person plural exclusive to would be ushoshimi. Um, one thing that you can also see uh, with the word to love here is that the root has a, the vowel o at the end, but I have a vowel deletion rule um, in my language that basically means that if there are two vowels next to each other, with the exception of diphthongs, the first vowel is deleted. So when the suffix e is at the end of the root of um, o is deleted, leaving uh, just the suffix e at the end. Uh, finally, I have a couple of sentences so you can get a feel for the structure of the language. So the first part sentence here, I, I speak as a keye, would be Lili si lo as a keye. Uh, the second sentence here, he or she loved you, would be Ashosha Teban. And the last sentence, the women are not going sailing, would be Gi Nunoni Chafama Bazaza E. Um, so the way that I do uh, plurals in my language is with partial reduplication, which basically means that you copy the first syllable uh, in the root and add it to the beginning. So the singular for a woman is aza e, and then the plural would be azaza e, and the definite marker is o, but again, because of my vowel deletion rule, the o at the end is deleted, it leaves bazaza e. So I really, I've only begun to create this language. I've really only scratched the surface of what it can do in terms of structures and words and things like that. Um, creating a constructed language is something that can take years. And I hope that this will be an ongoing project for me um, as I hope to incorporate this language, something like it in a novel of some kind someday. Um, and that's it, any questions?